we would in, like to invite the youth to come forward and, and be seated in the places that have been reserved for you. People of God, good morning. good morning. My name is Jerry Gosselin, and I'm the executive director of the Ocean Park Association. And I welcome you to the Temple in Ocean Park. I would also like to extend a very warm welcome to those who are joining via live stream made possible by the Episcopal Diocese of Maine. To those joining us, at watch parties in Gardner and Booth Bay Harbor, in Thomaston, in Belfast, in Brewer, in Bar Harbor, in Portland, and in Winchester, Massachusetts. I say welcome. And I hope that I identified you all. <laughs> and to those well, uh, joining us from private homes throughout the state of Maine and beyond, welcome. The Ocean Park Association is a Chautauqua community that was established in 1881. And you are sitting in the original building that was built then in six weeks and under $4,000, if you can imagine that. <laughs> the founders envisioned a place where people could gather to be enriched by the four pillars of the Chautauqua movement, religion, education, cultural arts, and recreation. Teddy Roosevelt once referred to Chautauqua as the most American thing in America. From the beginning, we've presented a summer program season in support of those four pillars of the Chautauqua movement. And you are all welcome to join us throughout the summer, our 11-week season. And you can learn more about us by visiting www.oceanpark.org. Today we are beginning our 2019 season with a grand celebration as we welcome the Most Reverend Michael Curry, Presiding Bishop, and primate of the Episcopal Church in the United States. Now, many have asked me, how did you land this gig? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to admit, this one fell into my lap. John Hennessy, who is the Director of Communications for the Episcopal Diocese of Maine, visited us last summer to hear Sister Simone Campbell preach uh, here in the temple. She's involved in peace and justice movement in the United States and is based out of Washington. And John was here um, and looked up and looked around and thought, wow, this would be a great place for Bishop Curry to come um, when he's in Maine. And so um, he asked me, he introduced himself and asked me what I thought. I went, <laughs> duh. <laughs> <laughs> So, Bishop Curry, I understand that you brought a few of your closest friends with you today. And so, um, I would like to have a show of hands of the Episcopalians who have joined us this morning. <laughs> oh, my. Before Bishop does it, I'm going to encourage you to double your offertory next week um, <laughs> and to do so with Jacksons and not 
Washingtons, if you get what I mean. Now, Ocean Parkers, I know there may be a few of you here, so please savor the energy in this worship space this morning, because next week the Presbyterians are coming. <laughs> And so speaking of skipping out of your home parishes today, we have our great friend, Dean Ben Shambaugh of the Cathedral of St. Luke here today. He got his seat here up on the platform because he lugged his tuba into the building. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. <laughs> and I saved the last introduction uh, as the best one. The church of the present and the future is embodied by our youth. And today, they are represented by the main Episcopal youth. And I want them to be acknowledged this morning for their good work right now. And so I'm going to ask you to do something else, too. I, want, I would like for you to stand up and to look at that big camera out back and wave to all of the people who are joining us online through the live stream. There you go. And they came with special t-shirts on this morning, um, really describing Bishop Curry's message of the way of love. So uh, following the service, you may want to uh, connect with one of them and take a look at their embodiment of the bishop's teachings. We had a great day yesterday, didn't we? My wife, Judy and myself, we had the great honor and pleasure of being at the Cathedral of St. Luke for the ordination and consecration of the 10th Episcopal Bishop of Maine, Thomas James Brown, who is beginning his Episcopal ministry today in Waterville. Man, you folks know how to do processions. <laughs> wow. There were processions embedded within processions. <laughs> the celebration, while formal and serious, was holy and hope-filled, solemn and joyful, inclusive and personal. The congregation was fully responsive as it gave the new, Brit the new bishop unbridled support. It was truly the church of alive. So it, embedded within the procession, embedded within the procession, I had to take notice of the thoroughfare. Now, the thoroughfare is the one, were you the boat bearer? He's here. He's here. You were the boat bearer, okay. So, um, the thoroughfare is the person that holds the, the container for incense and there's burning charcoal inside. And I have to admit, that guy has skills. <laughs> He was whipping that thing around all over the place. <laughs> if he performed that ministry in Ocean Park today, he would need a special events permit and a burn permit <laughs> to do that. What a great job. But it was really a wonderful, wonderful celebration. So Bishop and 
um, folks who have gathered here, you know you're in a different place when Episcopalians are asked to raise their hands in church to be recognized. <laughs> When our youth are waving back to those viewing the live stream and sneaking the presiding bishop in through the back door and slipping him in by the side door. And there you have it, boom, an Ocean Park procession. <laughs> Bishop Curry, that's a long-winded way to get to this simple and straightforward statement. Welcome to Ocean Park and welcome home to Maine. And you are welcome here anytime on a free weekend. So sisters and brothers, this is the temple in Ocean Park, and we are celebrating the first Sunday of our 139th season. And from wherever you are right now, let us take a moment to prepare our hearts for worship.
This is a blessed day. Many of us gathered this morning are Episcopalian. Many of us are from other Christian traditions and families. Many of us are people of goodwill or of no particular denomination or stripe. We are here to be blessed to follow the way of love, Jesus Christ. What do we seek? We seek love because we all just want to be loved. We seek freedom. Every child of God was meant to be free. We seek abundant life, not carbon-based life, but the real thing. We seek Jesus. We who are here. Let us worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Let us raise our hearts and minds. Let us raise our voices. Let us shout to the mountaintop. Glory, hallelujah. Amen. Following the directive of Jesus, let us pray using the words he gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
reading from the Gospel of John. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now, remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from the Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Here ends the reading. my commandment. This is my commandment, that ye love one another, that ye
Let us pray. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, on this first Sunday service of the season at the Temple at Ocean Park, as we welcome another beautiful summer in Maine, let us remember that Jesus calls us to be a welcoming people. In his commandment to love each other as he loves us, he calls us to reach out to all of God's children, to welcome one another into our places of worship as we have been welcomed today, to welcome back the summer families returning to their cottages by the sea, and to welcome into our communities new families who have traveled far and endured many hardships in hopes of finding a safe home in Maine. All of us are welcome. All of us are children of God. Sisters and brothers, Jesus told his disciples, remain in my love. As his disciples today, let us recognize and give thanks that in order to remain in his love, we must first acknowledge that we are in his love. In spite of our faults and shortcomings, in spite of the countless times that we fall short of God's desires for us, in spite of our sins, we are already in God's love. And Lord, we do want to remain in your love. So please stir up in our hearts and our minds and strengthen our backs and our hands so that we may become productive workers in your vineyard, fishers of men and women in your harbors, branches that bear fruit that will last. All this we ask in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Please be seated. I would be remiss if I did not take a moment to acknowledge um, other partners in ministry and partners in, in, uh, in music and in ushers and all of the ministries that are, uh, have gathered today and uh, have added their gifts to this celebration. So um, I want to acknowledge you all and there are many of you that have taken great interest in today's service. Thank you. Let us pray. Source of all good blessings in our lives, we, we bring you our gifts with joy, but knowing that often our generosity has been regulated by our fears. We live in uncertain times and we sometimes fear uncertainty, whether our money will last or whether we will find ourselves in need. We admit that sometimes we have heard but not heeded the words from your son, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Grant us courage to experience the joy of deep generosity without fear. We pray this in the name of our risen Savior, who thought the cross was not too great a price to pay for us. Amen.
And now in the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. <laughs> it, is good, it is good to be here, and I hope you're glad to be here. I hope you're glad to be here. Yeah. It's good to be here. <laughs> it's good to be here. <laughs> I, I've got to tell you, uh, in all honesty, after hearing this marvelous choir sing, I think anything I say will be redundant. <laughs> thank you, choir, and thank you, musicians. Thank you. And I'm limping just a little bit. I did something to, um, I got a preliminary diagnosis. Something's going on with a ligament in my right foot. And, but I, I believe Suzanne's a physician, so it was good to sit next to her. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but I told Jerry, he said, if you want to move around a bit, we've got an extra microphone for you. And I said, normally I would, but it might be more of a hop than a move. <laughs> But it, is, um, it was a, a joy yesterday to be with, with many who were um, celebrating and praying together at the ordination and consecration of, of Thomas James Brown um, as the Episcopal Bishop here in Maine. And uh, to give thanks for the ministry of, of Bishop Steve Lane, who has gone ahead where I'm going to go one day and retire <laughs> in retirement. Um, and a blessing to be with you now, to have been with the young people who are here earlier uh, to meet uh, Jerry and the members of the board and, and all who have um, keep this sacred place sacred. Um, I know of the Chautauqua movement both from having been in seminary and um, I think the name Horace Bushnell is um, uh, vaguely related in the annals of 19th century history and I grew up in Buffalo, New York, not far from Chautauqua, so I know of you and know of this movement's importance historically but, but for the future. And I just thank God for you. And, and thank everybody for coming out. I can't believe there are this many Episcopalians in one place. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> but Jerry, to you and to all who continue to make this place possible, we thank you and thank God for you. And, and they told me uh, early on um, when we were getting ready to come out that um, somebody who I just have great respect for, um, and I know you do as well, uh, kind of quietly slipped in. And somewhere in here, Senator Angus King is in this room, and we are so glad to have you here. There he is. <laughs> is a remarkable guy and um, a, a, a person of genuine wisdom, um, a wisdom that we need in these days. And I just thank God for him. And he um, helped us um, with a congressional prayer service just about two months ago. And um, I thank him and thank you and thank God for you. So I'm glad to be here. And I want you to just turn to that neighbor next to you and you tell him, you know something, I'm glad to be here. Just turn and tell him, I'm glad to be here. Because it is good to be here. <laughs> Now, whoever said Maine Leiden Protestants can't do evangelism? You just did it. <laughs> you just did it. <laughs> Allow me, if you will, to offer uh, some reflections from um, uh, 2 Corinthians, um, where St. Paul writes these words. And you've heard part of them before, but the words that preface the part that you're probably more familiar with are probably less familiar, but actually define the latter part. For the love of Christ urges us on. Because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. He died for all so that we might live, so that we might live no longer for ourselves alone. 
and then he was raised from the dead. So now, we regard no one from a human point of view, simply. Even though we once even knew Christ from a human point of view, we regard him thus no longer. For if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who in Christ was reconciling the world to himself and who has now given to us the ministry of reconciliation for the love of Christ urges us on. As the old King James says, the love of Christ compels us. As another version says, the love of Christ inspires us to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died and was raised again. Therefore, you see the logic, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God who in Christ was reconciling the world to himself and who has now given to us us, Episcopalians, Presbyterians next week, us, <laughs> to all of us, the Ministry of Reconciliation. Dr. King, commenting on this very passage, said, we must discover the power of love, the redemptive power of love. And when we discover that, we will be able to make of this old world a new world, because love is the way. And if Dr. King was not convincing, I'm told Prime Minister William Gladstone of the previous, of the 19th century said it, and that Mahatma Gandhi, somewhat later in India's freedom movement, said it. But I didn't meet William Gladstone or Mahatma Gandhi. I heard it when Jimi Hendrix said it. <laughs> and Jimi said it this way, when the power of love overcomes the love of power, then the world will know peace. Then the world will know peace. Yep, then. Love, I'm convinced that love is the way. It is the only way. It is the way that transcends all of our differences and divisions, some noble and some ignoble. It is the way that can help us find a way forward, not only in this country, but in this world in which we live. It is the way, it is the only way, the only way, if the love of Christ the love of God impels us. Now, I have to admit, the older I, I get and the, the longer I'm around, the, more, the, the simpler I become. Um, because part of it is I think the brain doesn't handle too much complexity yet, the older you get. <laughs> but, but I am, I've been more and more convinced that, that our Christian faith is not that complex. It is difficult to do but it is not complex. I'm convinced that, that Jesus came among us, that God sent Jesus. God came among us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth for a very simple and yet complex purpose. He came to show us the way. He came to show us the way to stop living nightmares and how to discover God's dream. He came to show us the way to rebuild our societies and our lives into something reflecting God's dream and hope for all of us when God first declared, let there be anything else at all. He came to show us the way to be reconciled and in relationship 
with the God who is the creator of us all and of everything. He came to show us the way to be reconciled in relationship with each other as children of this one God and creator of us all. He came to show us the way. He, ca he came to show us the way to be more than individualized collections of self-interest. He came to show us the way to be more than simply, forgive me for saying it this way, to be more than simply the human race. That's good, but it's not good enough. He came to show us how to become the human family of God. And in that is our hope and our salvation, temporal and eternal. He came to show us how to live as God has intended from the very beginning. I mean, the, the, the truth is that there is a profound difference between living and simply existing. Existence is a matter of survival. And Darwin was right, it's survival of the fittest. You know, and I suppose that's a part of the natural world, and you got to start somewhere, but it's not the end game. He, he, does it, if you don't believe me, have you all ever watched Survivor on TV? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the whole point of Survivor on TV or survival is that I survive by knocking you off the, the island. Now, that may be survival, but that's not life. You see what I'm getting at? Jesus came to show us how to live. I mean, the truth is how to become more than just simply the human race. That's a mere biological category. It's necessary, but that's not the abundance of life as God intended. That's the point of departure, not the end game. I mean, you know, think about it. Well, let me put it this way. My, my wife, uh, I'm a dog person, and I, I like cats, but I'm a dog person. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> So we have quite a, a, what shall I say, an ecumenical and interracial and interreligious uh, family, dogs and cats. But, um, but, but my wife has two cats that, that I live with. And um, <laughs> I mean, I, just, I like them, but I don't understand them. It's hard to have a reciprocal relationship. But anyway, but, but her two cats are, are, they're really fascinating creatures. And you know, the truth is, um, when I think about them and th that they are, they, they, they exist. I mean, they have life in them. They're God's creatures and all of that. Um, but but I, how shall I say this? Well, I remember when I was in um, probably eighth grade, we took living things. It was kind of early biology for eighth graders. And I remember we learned about living things. And specifically, we learned that human beings are part of the mammal world, if you will. We're mammals. And that we share with other mammals certain salient and common characteristics. And there are several of them. But among them, there are three principal ones, uh, consumption, uh, respiration, and reproduction. We eat, um, we breathe, and, and we make more of our own kind. My wife's cats can do that. Actually, they can do two out of the three. We've taken care of one. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, and that's wonderful. That's part of, of, of this a form of life, to be sure. But is that the abundance of life, if you will? When Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I have come that you might have life, the quality of life, the life as God dreamed and intended that not even the titanic power of death can take away from you. Oh, I have come that you might have life. In fact, John's gospel actually ends with, well, actually it doesn't. It, it, it's chapter 20, which is one ending. It's, it's the, the scholars say it was the, probably the original ending, but somebody added an appendix, which is chapter 21. Uh, they don't understand. See, I'm a preacher, and I know preachers. <laughs> and John was a preacher. He finished the sermon at chapter 20, and then he thought about something else and took the plane back up and came around for another. That's what's really going on. <laughs> But, but at the end of chapter 20, um, John ends his gospel by saying, there are many other things that I have, 
that I, that I could tell you. Um, but these few things that I have written in this gospel, I have shared with you so that you might come to believe that this Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life. Life, Zoe, life. Real life, not vials. The, the, the Greek language has different words for different kinds of life. My cat has vials. <laughs> Jesus was talking about vials is a beginning, but more than mere vials, life, life of integrity, life of dignity, life of honor, life saturated by eternity. Life that not even death can take away from you. No. Jesus came to show us how to live. And he taught us that the way to live and find life is love. As the Father has loved me, he says, so have I loved you. Abide dwell, inhabit, be inhabited by my love. This he said at the Last Supper. At the Last Supper, as Judas has slithered out of the room to betray him. At the Last Supper, as Peter will, will not even know who he is in a few hours. At the Last Supper, before he will be tortured, tried unjustly, convicted, and killed as the Father has loved me so have I loved you a new commandment I give you not a new option <laughs> y'all with me on that one? Eh? A, a, a new commandment I give you that you love one another Greater love has no one, no, no, greater love has no one than this, but that they give up their life for their friends. I have called you my friends. Love. Love when the world falls apart. Love when you don't know what else to do. Love will lift you up. Love will set you free. And love, he was telling them as he faced his own death. Love will see you through even when you can't see ahead of you. Love. Love is the way. It's the only way. Let me tell you why. Are, are y'all still with me? You still wait? And I, okay. <laughs> Let me. It, it, and I know that there's, there's complexity with that word love. We, we only have one word for love in English. Um, the Greek language, at least of the New Testament, has three. There are a couple of other words, but, but has three, eros, agape, and philia. Eros is romantic love, so you get the nuance of romantic love. Um, philia is uh, fraternal love. So we get city of Philadelphia, brotherly love, um, that kind of friendship um, love. And agape um, is detached love. The Buddhists talk about detachment, if you will. Agape is that kind of detached love, if you will, that is not centered on the self, but actually seeks the good and the welfare and the well-being of other. God so loved the world, not because God was having erotic impulses about us. <laughs> God so loved the world, not because God was just our buddy. No, God so loved the world that he gave, because that's what God does, agape, um, giving of the self, um, not worrying about the self first, but seeking the good and the welfare and the well-being of others. That's what Jesus is talking about most of the time when he talks about love. Somehow, we must move from love as a mere sentiment to love as a disciplined commitment. Commitment to seek the good and the welfare of others, sometimes even before my own. And that kind of, y'all with me on this one? That kind of love makes all the difference in the world. So for years, if you had asked me a couple years ago what, what the um, opposite of love is, I would have immediately and instinctively, and, and not incorrectly, but I would have immediately said, well, the opposite of love is hate. 
And to be sure, that's true. But, but, but hatred is a derivative of the real opposite of love. The real opposite of love is selfishness. Think about it for a moment. Hatred is a derivative of that. Hatred emerges very often out of fear for self-preservation. I'm afraid of you intruding into my world and somehow being a danger and a threat to me. Therefore, I will hate you or I will stereotype you. Um, or, you see where I'm going with this? Um, I will treat you as the other uh, who is a danger or a threat to my organism, to me. It's just basic biological instinct and response. Y'all with me so far? <laughs> now, hatred is a derivative of that self-centeredness. That selfishness, and the truth of the matter is, if, if you look at the scriptures and listen to the Christian tradition, um, when it's wise, it's wise most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, um, uh, at its deep wisdom, the ancient fathers and mothers of the early church in the first few centuries used to speak of sin as inordinate self-pride. I think that's what Ryan Holt Niebuhr called it. Just wanted y'all to know I did go to seminary. Um, as, <laughs> right? as an inordinate self-pride where the self is made the center of the universe and everything and everybody is the periphery. And they said that is the root cause of what we call sin, self-centeredness, selfishness, every war that has ever been fought, every bigotry that has ever been wrought, every hatred, every humanly created wrong that has been done against anybody has its roots in that selfishness. Now, I was at a wedding not long ago. <laughs> it was a nice little affair in a chapel, not far away. <laughs> and and uh, uh, when the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury called and, and um, um, you know, said, well, actually the instruction, the question was, if you are asked to preach at a, an upcoming royal wedding on May 19th, <laughs> would you be available? <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, I don't know who's getting married. But anyway, it was... <laughs> So, so after the kind of preliminary conversations, which were probably in late January or early February, um, we were asked to, to uh, sit on that information. I couldn't even tell my wife about it. I couldn't tell anybody because there were a, a number of protocols that had to go through, and I'm sure they had to do their background check and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and so all I knew was that I was being asked to preach on May the 19th, um, but then I realized I was supposed to be in the Diocese of Arizona the weekend of May the 19th, and I had to tell Bishop Kirk Smith, I had to tell him something, um, and so we eventually got permission to tell him, but to, to, to swear him to silence, um, <laughs> otherwise the British version of the CIA would come down on him and get him. <laughs> so we couldn't say anything, and so I didn't know any more about what I was expected to do or not. I didn't know what the, the text of scripture was, um, and I was, I was nervous because I was fully expecting the passage of scripture, <laughs> nine out of ten weddings that I've done over the years, the passage that the, the couple would like is 1 Corinthians, you know it, 13. And, and I like 1 Corinthians 13, don't misunderstand me. <laughs> but I was saying, please give me something else to talk about. <laughs> And I was so happy when they called, uh, said they want the Song of Solomon. I, I said, I know nobody even knows about that one. That's a good one. Thank you. <laughs> but, but first, you know, everybody picks First Corinthians 13 for weddings, and that's fine. Don't misunderstand me. But because it does speak of love. It's incredible poetry. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am a noisy dong, a clanging cymbal. Um, now faith, hope, and love abide these, these three. But the greatest of these... This is St. Paul talking. No flaming liberal to be sure. Uh, now, right? Now, right? Faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. But if you look carefully at 1 Corinthians 13, read the middle of the poem. Love is not jealous. Love is not rude. Love is not boastful. Love does not insist on its own way. 
Love, in other words, seeks the good and the welfare of the other. Love moves over to allow the other to be. Love creates space for the other to be. Love creates space for a relationship. Now, the truth is, if you look at all of 1 Corinthians, the whole thing, that passage makes sense when you read the rest of the book. Because <laughs> Paul didn't write it thinking about a wedding, though it may apply. <laughs> Paul wrote it because he was dealing with a dysfunctional church. I know we don't have any of those here, but, but there they had them. The church of Corinth was a congregational development nightmare. I mean, first, if you go back and look in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, I mean, Paul says, this is fascinating. Think about your own church when I, when I say this. Paul says, it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that you have, <laughs> right? I, every church I have ever pastored had a Chloe in the conversation. <laughs> every, there's a Chloe in every church. That busybody, she knows everybody and everybody's business. And this is before texting and tweeting and social media. Somehow Paul got the word way away from Corinth. It has been reported to me by Chloe's people. Uh, and, 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 and the report is that the church is dividing itself into factions. Some according to baptism. Some say, oh, I was baptized by Peter. I'm better than you. Some say I was baptized by Paul. Some say I was baptized by somebody. Some by baptized. The church was dividing itself into factions. And then you go on and read the rest of it, and it really does get, um, this is, I mean, this, this makes soap operas boring. I mean, you read the rest of it, um, um, you got one parishioner who's suing another parishioner. Then, then you got um, one parishioner who's sleeping with somebody else's wife. This is in the Bible. I'm not making this up. Um, uh, then you got, they're coming to Holy Communion, and apparently some people are getting drunk at communion, <laughs> right? Um, and coming back for seconds and thirds or whatever. Uh, and, and then you got, there's actually a sociological di differentiation. The rich get their communion first, and the poor have to wait for them. And then you got folk, some folks say, well, I speak in tongues, therefore I'm a better Christian than you do, and you don't speak in tongues, so you're not a Christian. And then they're fussing and biting about who's the better Christian. And then you got some folk who's saying, I know I've already been resurrected. Um, and some folks said, you ain't died yet, you ain't resurrected nothing. <laughs> I mean, this is a church. It's a crazy church. And it's in the midst of this, this cacophony of, of craziness and chaos that Paul says, listen to me, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, though I have prophetic powers so as to even move mountains. If I have love, I am a mere noisy gong a clanging cymbal, Shakespeare's tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Love is not jealous. It's not rude. It does not insist on its own way. Now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and they're important. But the greatest of these is love. Love is the cure for selfishness. And it is the cure for all of the ailments that we create from selfishness. The old slaves used to say it this way. If you cannot preach like Peter, and you cannot pray like Paul, you just tell the love of Jesus how he died to save us all. Oh, there is a balm, a healing balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. Love. Well, I'm going to bring this plane down. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have to tell you, Is it working? I'm not going to go too far, but the doctor's here in case I need her. <laughs> I have to tell you that if you look at Jesus and his teachings, you will see that he was clear as clear could be 
that love is the key to everything. And it has primacy over faith, over hope, over doctrine. I've been reading about Maine. <laughs> and I understand that lighthouses are important here. <laughs> Love is the lighthouse that can show us the way to safe harbor. I, I, I want you to know I worked on that. Um, why? You, you're not, I, I didn't. I, <laughs> I worked on that. <laughs> and, and Jesus actually said as much. He was in one of the, he had several conversations with lawyers. And I, don't, I bet there's some lawyers in this room right now. Um, but Jesus was always talking to lawyers, to tell you the truth. And he had one um, where this, this lawyer came up to him and he said, great teacher, what is the greatest teaching in all of the legal edifice of Moses? And, and Jesus said, well, Moses, he reached back to Deuteronomy and Leviticus in the Hebrew scriptures. And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and great commandment. But the second is just like it, just as important. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, listen to this. On these two commandments, love of God and love of neighbor, hang all the law and the prophets. Everything that Moses was trying to teach, everything that the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Zephaniah and Ezekiel tried to teach, everything that's basically you could extrapolate, everything that's in what we call the scriptures, it hangs and depends on love of God and love of neighbor. The truth is love of God, love of neighbor as yourself. This is the key to life. This is actually the secret to life. It's the way to become all that God intends for all of us to be. And the truth is, I've said it before, I'll say it again. If it's not about love, it is not about God. <laughs> and, and, and Jesus was so incredibly clear. Love God. You don't have to agree with God. I mean, read the Psalms. They fuss with God all the time. I can assure you God can handle you being angry at God. You won't be the first or the last, you know? But, 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 but love God. Love doesn't mean you have to always agree. It means I love you enough to trust you, even when I'm not sure. Love God. Because whether you can feel it or not, God loves you. God loved you enough to give you whatever moment and breath of life you and I have ever had. Love the Lord your God. And love your neighbor. Now again, notice the language. Jesus said, love your neighbor. He didn't say like him. <laughs> <laughs> you may or may not like him. Liking is an emotional response or reaction, actually. Love is a commitment and a decision that I will seek the good and the welfare, not just of myself, but of the other. That's what love is. Love your neighbor, no matter who your neighbor is. I was just in New York City. Now, I, I, I knew where I was in New York City, and this was something sponsored by the Riverside Church, and I knew there were probably very few Republicans in the, in the audience where I was. I said, but love of neighbor means that those of you who are Democrats, and they got real quiet. I said, y'all got quiet on me now. That's all right. Democrat, find a Republican and love them. <laughs> yeah, y'all getting quiet too. I see that. All right. <laughs> That's all right. Republicans, you find a Democrat and you love them. Independents, you can go any way you want to go. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't <laughs> Love your neighbor, and your neighbor is every other human child of God. All of us created in the image and likeness of God. All of us love your neighbor, even when you disagree. And I'm here to tell you, if we could get that right, we might be able to fix this tired old troubled world if we would just ground everything that we do in love of neighbor. And while you're at it, love yourself. Now, there's a difference between a healthy self-love and selfishness. A healthy self-love loves the self because God made you. 
I want to say something to these young people here, and y'all listen in. <laughs> I don't know if I can actually get down these steps, but if I, I'll get down. I'm okay. I'm all right. I'm, I'm going to do it. You thought preachers couldn't walk on water. <laughs> anyway, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> love your God, love your neighbor, and love yourself. God made you. God created you. You and we are the children of God. All of us love what God has made. I learned this some years ago. I was a pastoring in Cincinnati, or actually in Lincoln Heights, just outside of Cincinnati. And, and um, we lived in the uh, uh, rectory, Parsonage, the manse, right, right next door to the church. It was actually connected to the church. And, and um, everything went well until winter came and the church was there was a big field behind the church and when winter came for whatever reason all of the field mice <laughs> got religion <laughs> and came to church <laughs> which also meant they visited our house where we lived and so, you know, I remember talking with the vestry, the governing board of the church, and, and, you know, we got exterminators to come, you know, and try to do what they could do. The problem was our oldest daughter, who's now late 30s, was three or so. So we had a toddler in the house, and they couldn't use the, you know, the poisons and that kind of stuff because you got a little kid in the house. And we had a dog, too. But anyway, but they didn't, couldn't use. So they recently had just started using, this is back in the uh, early 80s, um, what, what he described as a non-violent means of extermination. <laughs> I, I'm real, I believe in non-violence, but I'm not sure that those two worked and neither did the mice. It didn't work. The glue traps and all that kind of stuff. Well, nothing was really working and the mice were overrunning the place. And finally, um, in desperation, I was at the school, there were the, the Sisters of the Transfiguration, who had started the church, had a convent school, and I was the chaplain at the school, so I was up at the school for something in the teacher's lounge and got to talking about, you know, these mice, and one of the teachers, um, Liz Sorrell, said, well, I've got two cats and, and a dog, and the dog and the other cat are beating up on this cat, and I'd be willing to give you her. And I remember thinking, look, this cat is already losing a fight. I don't want, I mean, I mean, I mean I'm into nonviolence, but if I'm going to get a cat, I want to kill her. And so, so I said, well, Liz, what's the cat's name? And she said, Muffin. <laughs> and I said, look, the cat should be named Killer, and I'd have more infant. But again, nothing else had worked. Nothing human beings had come up with was working. And so I, I went over, we bought one of these, you know, carrying cases and went over to Liz's house, got the cat and put the cat in the cage and looked at her. I said, Liz, this is an ugly cat. <laughs> I mean, she really was one of the, you know, the tortoise shell kind and kind of, she was really ugly and she was like, so, and this is the only, t the cat wanted to get out of that house so much. This is the only time I met somebody who wanted to be incarcerated. I mean, <laughs> this cat, I mean, she was so happy to get in that cage and get out. I mean, and she was like dribbling. She, was, she would dribble out of her mouth when you'd pet her on her head. She was just, this was a needy cat with some issues. No question about it. <laughs> So we get the cat to the house, and I let her out of the cage, and she, she met our dog. We had a dog, a German Shepherd. Uh, we got him when he was a puppy, and um, I was in a clergy meeting, a clerical meeting, and um, had just gotten this new puppy, and they said, we dare you to name the dog Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> Which I did, actually. <laughs> Because I kind of said there's going to be one bishop in this church who's going to obey Michael Curry. When I say, sit, bishop, he's going to sit. Roll over, bishop, he'll roll over. So, 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 so we get home, and, and, and Muffin and, and Bishop became fast friends, and that was wonderful and beautiful, and the cat was there for a good while, and, but she wasn't catching any mice. And I was wondering, is this cat going to eventually do her job? And I remember calling Liz, saying, Liz, you got to do something. She said, just wait. She's a good mouser. I said, okay, waited. And then one night, I was getting up um, to go in the kitchen and get a cookie or something. Um, and I was walking through the living room, and I could see Muffin in her crouching tiger position. And I knew she was hunting. I know when a cat does that, that's what they're doing. They're hunting. 
And I stood there and watched. Now, this cat normally was dysfunctional and dribbling. I mean, you, I mean you, she was so happy you were petting her on the head, she'd be dribbling out of her mouth. And I, I mean, you couldn't get rid of You sit down, she was in your lap. And it was nice, but after a while, I said, cat, go get a life. You know, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> so I watched her in this crouching tiger position, and she moved. It's an incredible thing to watch a cat hunt. It's a beautiful thing, unless you're the mouse. <laughs> and she would take, you know how they take a step, take another step, and then she would go down, and then she pounced. And I saw it. Mickey Mouse bit the dust. I saw it that night. I saw it. And, and from that point on, I mean, almost, it felt like it was every night. This cat was hunting every night. I mean, so much so. It, it, it would, like in the morning, you'd go through the living room. It was like walking through a cemetery. I mean, they were all, it was like headstones everywhere. And, and one night, I literally got up in the middle of the night just to go to the bathroom or something and put my foot in the slipper. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And I picked it out and said, oh, my God. And my wife said, see, now, that, now people at church give you a little percentage, but she gave you half of what the Lord gave her. Now, that's a, that's a good gift. <laughs> anyway, this went on for a while, and really, Muffin, did, she wiped out the mice. And the next summer, and the next winter, we really didn't have any mice. I mean, we didn't have any, we didn't have a mouse problem. I mean, Muffin was on the prowl. And after, after experiencing, and she lived to be some 20 years old, so she lived well, but after that, I began to think about something. I realized that as long as Muffin was being, if you will, misused and not allowed to be who and what the Lord God Almighty put that cat on this earth to be, that cat was dysfunctional, dribbling and drooling. But when that cat was allowed to be who God made her to be, was allowed to be the hunter that God made her to be, Muffin was not just a, an ordinary cat. She became super cat. It was incredible. And the truth is, now my grandma used to sing this song in her church. Uh, I grew up Episcopalian, but grandma was a dyed in the wool rock rib Baptist. And grandma used to sing a song about St. Paul that went like this. It is no secret what God can do, what he did for Paul, he'll do for you. Well, I'm here to tell you, it is no secret what God can do, what he did for Muffin, he'll do for you. <laughs> he'll do for you. I saw a cat loved into being who God made her to be. And I believe that love can help us all to become who God has intended us to be. That love can help us bring an end to hunger. That love can help us bring an end to loneliness. That love can help us make poverty history. That love can make room for us all on God's good green earth. That love can set us all free. So if you cannot preach like Peter, and you cannot pray like Paul, you just tell the love of Jesus how he died to save us all. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to the sin sick soul. God love you. God bless you. And may God hold us all in those almighty hands of love. Amen.
I just want you to know, Bishop Curry, I'm a cat person. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe in the way of love. Bishop Curry sought the wisdom of fellow Episcopalians on how the church should follow Jesus more deeply, what he calls the Jesus movement, not just in word, not just in deed, but for real. How do we help folks throw themselves into the arms of Jesus? Because when we do it and abide in him, we can bear fruit we never imagined possible. They came up with seven practices for living this way and seeking Jesus. Turn, learn, pray, worship, bless, go, rest. It starts with turn or repentance. It is not about beating up on yourself. It's about turning from old ways that don't work and old habits that don't work. Turning and turning like a flower turning in the direction of the sun. So first we must turn, then learn, as in learn and read the teachings of Jesus in scripture daily. It goes on, turn, learn, then pray and worship as we might expect. Then bless, we have been blessed in order to be a blessing to each other and the world. Then go. Go and make disciples. Go and practice the good news. Go and be God's witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, the first century Galilee, and in 21st century Ocean Park and Maine. And wherever you come from, those of you who are here at today's worship and online around the world. Finally, there is rest. Sabbath rest is there in the book of Genesis for a reason. Even God had to rest. Today, let us think about making a commitment to follow a rule of life set out in these practices. This is not our church, it is Christ's church. We're just a bunch of recovering sinners who have been saved by the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus bids any one of us who wants to, regardless of what we have done in the past, or where we were born, or what our status in society is, to follow him and join the new community of those being made new in Christ, the Jesus movement. I ask you to stand if you are able so that you may renounce sin and profess your faith and do it with gusto like Bishop Curley. <laughs> do you renounce the forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin? I do. do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to transform evil and injustice and oppression in all its forms and change them into what is good and whole? I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him in union with the universal church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? I do. Sisters and brothers, this is our faith. This is the faith of the church. We are proud to profess it through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Now go forth into the world in peace. Be strong and of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil, but love the Lord your God, love your neighbor, and love yourself. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be on you this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>